Uh, good morning in Mexico. Good afternoon in South Africa. Uh, welcome to our series of literary seminars, uh, Writers in Conversation, Mexico and South Africa. My name is Arturo Mendoza. I am the director of the Mexican Studies Center. We are representing the Mexican, uh, the National Autonomous University of Mexico in South Africa. And we are located in Johannesburg at the University of the Witwatersrand in the School of Literature, Language and Media. Um, I would like to begin by thanking all those who made this event possible. Uh, believe it or not, we've been working on the organization of this event for more than one year. So many, many thanks to those who have greatly contributed and supported the organization of this event. Uh, colleagues from UNAM, thank you very much, Carla Morales, Alexandra Saavedra, Anel Perez, Daniela Tarazona, and David Reed. David Ruiz. Uh, they work at Literatura UNAM and Catedra Extraordinaria Carlos Fuentes. Uh, my colleague uh, David, he works with me here uh, at UNAM South Africa. And on behalf of, uh, of BITS, uh, thank you very much, Bronwyn uh, Lofilion, Head of Creative Writing at the School of La uh, Literature, Language and Media. Uh, Bronwyn is also moderating this session. And I also would like to thank Roberto Cruz and Carl Van Beek, speakers of this inaugural seminar, Setting the Scene, Contemporary Mexican and South African Literature. Uh, before I begin, I would like to give the floor to Una Manvitz colleagues who will give some brief welcoming remarks. So please uh, welcome Anel Perez. Anel Perez is the director of Literatura Una. Thank you very much, very much Arturo. First of all, of course, I would, I would have to apologize if, because of my English. But um, my message is very, very simple. I just wanna let you know that we're really excited because we've been working on this project for about more, more than one year ago. And uh, the original idea was to think the act of reading and the act of knowing literature and linking it, it with uh, human rights issues such as violence, as migration and other contemporary issues that makes that literature becomes a tool or an instrument to find that, uh, that enormous part of human rights in literature. So we're really excited to come uh, to have come today. So very welcome everybody in, in our series of literary sem seminars. We're really uh, happy to have Roberto Cruz Arzabal today. He's um, a very uh, interesting colleague from a very interesting university of Mexico, Universidad Veracruzana which is very powerful in literature. So Roberto, thank you very much. And uh, Carl Van Wyck, we're really excited to have uh, in, in the dialogue with you. So I think that uh, Mexico and South Africa, we can definitely find some links and issues of our context, social context, political context, and definitely the lack of human rights in our country. So that is the, 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 the issue. That is why we're so excited Arturo, it's been a pleasure, an enormous pleasure to have you here and to, to work and think and construct this with Brown, Brownwin, with you and with everybody in the Vit University. So thank you, especially, of course, to the Catedra Carlos Fuentes. Uh, the, the leader is somewhere here in the, in the, in the Zoom. It's Alejandra Saavedra and, of course, Carla Morales, who ha have been um, interesting support and uh, very helpful equipment. So thank you for UNAM South Africa. Thank you for uh, VIT University. And please enjoy this literary cycle. I think we, we're going to find very interesting issues and hopefully will be the first of many other uh, conferences like this and courses. So we are pleased to, to have you today. My only, uh, my final um, message is to welcome you and to thank everybody here. Thank you very much, Anel. And then I, will, I would like to give the floor to Professor Dan Ohwang. He is the head of the School of Literature, Language, and Media and Bits. Uh, welcome, Dan. Uh, yeah, thanks, thanks, Arturo. Um, uh, good evening uh, to those of us in South Africa and uh, uh, good morning to, to those in uh, Mexico. Um, on behalf of Bits uh, University, I just wanted to you know, once again, welcome you to today's event. Um, I extend, uh, you know, particular welcome to uh, those who are participating from the Mexico side. Um, it's extremely gratifying uh, that uh, the organizers of this event, uh, both in South Africa and in Mexico, uh, have managed to, to mount the event. Um, 
I know that it's taken a lot of uh, planning over a long period of time. I think uh, uh, Aturo, the, the initial conversations that I think I was having with David were, you know, perhaps about a year ago. Um, um, you know, for us, I mean, uh, this is a particularly uh, important event, uh, given that we, I don't know that we've had, you know, uh, cross-continental events of this kind ever since we incepted uh, the center, uh, you know, for, for Mexican studies at VETS uh, a, a few years ago. Uh, I mean, we, 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 we've had some events, but, uh, you know, a few live, I don't, I don't think we've had many uh, live uh, uh, cross-continental events, uh, you know, uh, linking our two institutions in, in this particular format. Uh, so, so I'm quite happy that, you know, we, we, we've managed to, 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 to pull this off. Um, um, you know, part of uh, the, 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 the mandate of our collaboration uh, with, with UNAM is, is to use our specific locations uh, in what is generally called the Global South to generate uh, imaginative discussions uh, that speak to our specific context, uh, but also uh, that have relevance uh, to the wider global context in which we, 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 we operate. And I'm particularly pleased uh, that, you know, when I was looking through the, the brief uh, for this event, um, that one of the things it tries to do is to generate a conversations uh, on global multi-crisis. Uh, you know, Carla, you know, uh, Anel was talking about, uh, you know, human rights, climate change, violence, migration, uh, uh, and the pandemic. Uh, so uh, as we start, uh, you know, with uh, this initial event, which I hope will, uh, you know, uh, further down the line, uh, uh, lead to uh, a regular event that perhaps we have uh, on an annual basis. Uh, you know, my hope is that we, we have a productive uh, first uh, event uh, this evening and this morning. Uh, so once again, just uh, thanks and welcome to all the participants. Uh, I'm, I'm really pleased that we uh, have been able to pull this off at Turo and uh, Bronwyn and all the organizers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, and just a final comment for our uh, audience uh, here in Zoom or in our social media. Please feel free, to, feel free to participate with comments or questions in our chat box. Um, I would also like to let you know that we have a, a simultaneous translation here for those who are in Zoom. So if you look at if you go to the down part of your of your Zoom, then you will see interpretation interpretation, and then you can switch from English to Spanish. Uh, so Aida and Pilar are, are doing this simultaneous uh, translation into Spanish. Thank you very much. Um, and then, if whatever your contribution is, you can participate in Spanish or in English, and then I will pass the questions or your comments to to the chat box to Professor Brangwin uh, and. Uh, well, without uh, further ado, I would like to uh, give the floor to Professor Bronwyn. Uh, but before, I would like to read her, her bio, uh, if you allow me to. Uh, Bronwyn Law Filion is affiliated with the School of Literature, Language, and Media at the University of the Witwatersrand. She is an associate professor and head of creative writing and co founder of Fourth World Books. She has written on South African art and photography for many publications. Her first novel, The Printmaker, was shortlisted for the Sunday Times Fiction Award, and she also won, uh, she also won the 2018 Oliver uh, Schreiner Prize, and then her novel was published in French in 2019. Her second novel, which is set in New York, Johannesburg, and the Eastern Cape, will be released next year. Uh, so we are really looking forward to uh, getting this new uh, publication. Thank you very much, Ronwin, and then I will give you the floor. Thank you very much, Arturo. Um, also, just um, enormous thanks from my side to you and to David, uh, who drew me into this conversation and with whom I've been planning along with, with all of our colleagues in Mexico. It's been very exciting to, to think through this program, um, to talk about the writers in South Africa and Mexico that, we, uh, that I'm that we're all interested in and who have very important things to say about the contemporary moment. Um, thank you also to the Department of Sign Language, in particular Mpoteme 
and Augustine Clou, who are providing interpretation in South African sign language for those of you who can see Mpo and, and Augustine. And then I also would like to thank um, all of you who have logged in. Um, I know there's at least one person from Damascus. There are people from obviously from Johannesburg and um, various parts of South Africa, including Cape Town. Um, and I'm sure there are participants from across Mexico. So it's a very exciting, it's very exciting to be part of this um, very broad intellectual community. And thank you also in advance to the writers who will be drawn into this conversation over the next, hopefully two or three years for as long as we can manage to keep this conversation going, we'd like to, um, to sustain it. Um, hopefully into at least into 2023, Arturo and David. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it gives me great pleasure to, to welcome Carl van Weyck and Roberto Cruz Arzabal. Um, Roberto is a researcher with a PhD in literature from UNAM. He's a member of the Mexican National System of Researchers. He's the editor of the volume Aquí se esconde un paréntesis lecturas críticas a la obra de Cristina Rivera Garza, which was published in 2019. Uh, he's the co-editor of Historia de las Literaturas en México, uh, Asia un Nuevo Siglo, which was published also in 2019. And also he is the editor of Vocabulario Critico para Estudios Intermedios. And apologies for my um, Spanish pronunciation, <laughs> Roberto. He's also a member of the Mexican Studies Research Collective and the Extended Literature and Other Materialities Laboratory. Thank you for joining us, Roberto. It's a great pleasure to have you talking about contemporary Mexican literature. In Johannesburg, Carl, Dr. Carl van Weyck joins us from the Department of English, uh, where he began teaching in 2021 at the University of the Witwatersrand. His research and publication interests include postmodern historiography, and he is particularly concerned with World War II uh, alternate, with post World War II alternate histories, and South Africa's attitudes and representations uh, of apartheid history. <clears throat> Um, thank you, Carl, very much for your uh, participation in this event. So, um, Roberto, I think I'll begin with you. Uh, we're going to give you 15 or 20 minutes to, to, to do an almost impossible task, which is to set the scene for the, for the next couple of years, to talk a little bit about um, contemporary Mexican literature uh, and uh, your interpretation of the zeitgeist in contemporary Mexican literature. And I know you won't be able to, to touch on everything that's important, but um, I look, we look forward to hearing what you have to tell us. So over to you first, Roberto. Uh, thank you, Bronwyn. Uh, thank you, Arturo, Anel, uh, Alexandra, and, and all the people uh, who are committed to these uh, uh, encounters. I'm, I'm very grateful to participate. And I'm gonna read uh, a paper that I have uh, written. Um, uh, first, I want to, I, I would like to thank the help from uh, Marisol Garcia, who, who support me to write this, this piece of, of paper. Uh, I would like to offer a panoramic view of Mexican literature in the 21st century, being as close in time to it as we are, this could obviously result on a biased view, but I will, I will try to put forward some hypotheses, arguments, and notes on the matter in order to familiarize you with some trends and others who are currently relevant. I would like to start by describing 21st century Mexican literature in relation to what we could call Mexican literary tradition. This tradition was developed during a long historical process spanning almost 500 years since colonial literature emerged to the formation of the modern nation. The canon was formed during the 20th century by affirmation of a certain kind of modernity sustained by the political party in power. We could say that contemporary Mexican literature gained its form by distancing itself from the recent past. By doing this, an alternative tradition emerged which included long forgotten authors such as Nelly Campobello, Amparo Davila and Ulises Carrion. A revised version of the literary canon was built. I will not go as far as calling this an avant-garde, 
because there was not a clear antagonism with the past. I would rather say that this was an alteration that allowed a different view of Mexican literature. Revisionism sometimes fed on experimental procedures that appear in other countries, languages, and literary movements. Other times, these procedures were based on the recovery on lesser known works from Mexican and Latin American traditions. In some cases, the revisionist movement reappraised ideas and voices that had been silenced, such as female authors, ethnic minorities, political, sexual, and artistic dissidences. Mexican contemporary literature preoccupies itself with nonlinear genealogies as opposed to the philologic tradition with mage and archeology span from the past. This revision of the literary canon is of course not a phenomenon exclusive to Mexico. It is possible to point out both in Mexican literature and in other literary traditions, a tense but creative relationship between individual and collective memory. This tension becomes evident when literary works seem to answer to the question of how a singular and collective memory were formed without forgetting the official narrative. The literary form that emerged as an answer to this question was found by returning to historical documents that came from both official and private archives, as well as biographies, memoirs, photographs, and maps. The onset of historical fiction during the 80s and 90s was the first stage of a movement which found a renewed interest in 2010 on the 100 and 200 years anniversaries of the independence and revolution. For example, news from the empire by Fernando del Paso, in which the voice of a mentally ill Carlota or Charlotte of Belgium, the former empress of Mexico and wife of the emperor Maximilian, tell the story of the short-lived Mexican second empire and the war against the Mexican liberals on the 20th century through a very complex inner monologue in the prose of Fernando del Paso. Another example of these uses of memory and minor genres is the novel Tear This Heart Out by Angelis Mastreta, a very traditional Bildus woman about the life and love of Catalina Guzman during the post-revolutionary Mexico. A more radical and sometimes contrary approach to historical fiction was not based on memory, but rather on a material approach to these documents. This approach ceased to see the document as a contextual aid and rather saw it as a textual matter. This is the artistic procedure used in No One Will See Me Cry, the first novel of Cristina Rivera Garza about the life of Matilde Burgos, a fictional character based on Modesta Burgos, intern in La Castañeda, the asylum for mentally disabled and impoverished people at the end of Porfirio Diaz dictatorship. Since her first novel, Rivera Garza has used the documents and archives not only as a source, but as a material in which fiction can help us to listen to the voices of those who were silenced by the power of the state. Some of these works evoke experimental trends of literature in the global north, but I think it is important to point out that in the context of Mexican literature, they are not only taking pleasure in the literary form, but that the work on documentality maintains an ethical stance in relation to literary craft. These works aspire to the restitution of people and communities that have been forgotten by the state. I can mention the conceptualist drama Antigona Gonzalez by poet Sara Uribe, a powerful use of the classical figure, uh, figure Antigone, reformulated in the character of a Mexican woman who seeks the body of her brother Tadeo and listens to the voices of the wounded by the cartel and police violence. I will say that this is one of the main interests of contemporary literature, knowing how to listen to the victims of violence, dispossession, and oppression. Of course, there is an important and well-known tradition in Mexican literature that shared the same objective. For example, Cartucho, Tales of the Struggle in Northern Mexico, in which the author Nelly Campobello remembers the stories and griefs of the revolutionary peasants. Or the Book of Lamentation, in which Rosario Castellanos 
fictionalized the uprising of the indigenous of Chiapas against the power of the mestizo landowner in the 20th century, or the well-known work by Juan Rulfo, Pedro Paramo. Therefore, the work on the archives of violence is not a rupture, but rather a continuation by other means. Writers hear echoes from the past as well as the voices of the present. Their work deals not only with representing the victims of violence, they reflect upon the condition on which such violence was made. They are concerned with making the voices appear since the victims are a byproduct of the processes that turned Mexico into a modern nation. We can think in the recent books of Yuri Herrera, for example, particularly A Silent Fury, the El Bordo Mine Fire, a reflection upon the accident that caused the life of 87 miners and the afterlives of memory on the accident. In this work, like in, the, in, like in others, the official and unofficial documents and tales are entangled in the search for a common and complex memory. In this sense, the turn to memory is a shared characteristic with, with other literatures, especially with those that have a colonial past as well as those that have suffered the development of capitalism. That both history and violence are the protagonists of contemporary Mexican literature is not without reason. Even though Mexico is a country that was colonized 500 years ago and suffered through an independence war 200 years ago and a revolution a mere 100 years that resulted in an authoritarian state. The 21st century in Mexican literature seems to have two different beginnings. One, in 1994, the year that the nation signed the North American Free Trade Agreement, which promised to propel Mexico to its def definite globalization. The same year, the Zapatista uprising showed that globalization is also a document of barbarism that rooted since the colonial time. The second beginning can be dated to 2006, when the so-called Guerra contra el Narco began itself part of the war on drugs and the war on terror launched by the USA on a global scale. This, this second date allow us to understand the presence of violence and its spectacle as part of the cycles of production and consumption of images in mass media. The war on terror in order to exist uses the cruel exhibition of bodies that underwent violence as part of those cycles. It seems ironical, but it is symptomatic. The concept of gore capitalism coined by Sayak Valencia is illustrative of this. It also holds a close relationship to Ahil Mem Mbembe, better known concept of necropolitics. Contemporary Mexican society participates from both the consumption and production of global commodities. It is also a profoundly unequal society with natural resources and labor force that participates in extractivism as a generalized feature of capitalism. During the last 15 years, a fraction of Mexican literature has tried to answer, answer the question of how to speak of this violence without participating in this spectacle. One of the most important answers, as far as I can see, was put forward by author Cristina Rivera Garza in her concept of necro writing. It is a counterpart of the spectacle of violence in the fact that, is it, that it is a work with the material forms of the document, which I mentioned earlier on, and was also conceptualized by Rivera Garza as disappropriation and communality. Another answer to the question of the crisis of literary representation consists in an inquiry of realism, which dominated the 20th century and was an attempt to understand the violence generated by the revolution. An example can be found in the genre known as the Mexican Revolution novel, particularly in Mariano Azuela's The Underdogs. The new iterations of realism can exist in the form of other well-known genres, for example, the Dantesque allegory of the Central American migrants passing to Mexico in Among the Lost by Emiliano Monge the road novel of a half Mexican, half American family through the American light landscape and the personal memoir in Lost Children Archive by Valeria Luceli, or the popular tale made by rumors and repetition of violence in Fernanda Melchor's Hurricane Season. 
The value of fiction is not restricted to the representation of reality. It also stretches the possibilities of imagination. During the 20th century, literary works began to use elements drawn from, proper, from popular genres, which had been previously frowned upon by literary criticism. The presence of supernatural phenomena, ghost life in other planets and other tropes can be identified in other works of canonical authors, such as Juan Rulfo, Juan Jose Arreola, and Elena Garro. Due to the use of these elements, the works I mentioned before have often been wrongly categorized as magical realism. In the 21st century, Mexican literature has been exploring the forms and themes of horror, fantastic literature, science fiction, etc. This is closely related to the transformation and revision of the literary canon, as I mentioned before. Authors like Amparo Davila and Guadalupe Dueñas have been reappraised and now form part of the canon that runs parallel to social realism. Literary craft has also suffered transformations due to the contact with literatures written in indigenous languages, particularly with poetry. However, this has proved to be insufficient in terms of, in terms of integrating indigenous literature into the mainstream. Authors like Hubert Matiua, Irma Pineda, and Miquea Sanchez are recognized for offering a different view of life in Mexico. Some of these poets have been translated to other languages and have been awarded recognition in international festivals and forums. The fact that these authors tend to be less known in Mexico, even when they publish in state-owned publishing houses, is a contradiction worth of noting. The Mexican publishing field holds uh, similar contradictions to the literary field. In the 70s, public and private publishing houses emerged that succeeded in creating a network in Latin America and Spain with publishers in Argentina, Spain, Venezuela, etc. The next decade, however, was characterized by economic crisis in the transnationalization of cultural industries. This led to the acquisition and integration of these publishing houses by larger publishers. It is not a secret that nowadays, a large part of world literature is condensed in a few partnerships. This has led to a narrowing of the circulation of books between different countries and regions in the global south. One of the problems that the publishing world in Mexico faces, partly a consequence of what I just mentioned, is the dependence of scholarship and funding. Up until a few years ago, it was difficult to find books that didn't stem from public money. This may seem like the efforts of a state that is deeply interested in the dissemination of culture, but the funds are rather scarce and the public that can pay for books is very limited. This means that culture in Mexico, especially literature, is in case between the large numbers of sales that the transnational publishing houses report and the insufficient budget of the welfare state. However, Mexican literature is on the crossroad. After the so-called boom in the 60s and the 70s, Latin American literature has not occupied the same place in world literature as it used to. During the first years of the 21st century, it seemed that Roberto Bolaño would step up to this level of prestige and win him, possibly Mexican literature. After all, Bolaño received his intellectual formation in Mexico and some of his novels share common themes. The onset of this early, the, the onset of his early death prevented this from happening. One of the main problems that will concern criticism in the following years is the place that Mexican literature occupies within world literature. Maybe we should reshape the question of whether world literature is a place of arrival or rather just another way of reading text. Mexican literature's relationship to other literary traditions is going through a long transformational stage. We can only start to see its effects in recent works, but the signs are unequivocal. An example of this is the importance that creative writing programs in the US have acquired. Some of the most visible writers in the Spanish speaking world have been educated there. The professionalization of writers is not a new matter. Neither are the scholarships that the US offer to Mexican writers. However, the current situation is much different. 
partly because writing is nowadays regarded as a professional formation aimed at a market that seeks huge revenue as opposed to better works. Partly because North American universities have become centers for the production of literary works. Ironically, this does not necessarily mean that Mexican literature is more heterogeneous in its scope. On the contrary, the themes, trends, and forms are often regarded as the same. Of course, there are notable exemptions to the rule. One example is the work of Heriberto Yepes, characterized by his sharp criticism against both US and Mexican institutions and traditions. Books like The Empire of Neo-Memory and Transnational Battlefield are regarded as experimental works with a critical and decolonial viewpoint. The works of the writers I have mentioned about Cristina Rivera Garza, Yuri Herrera, Valeria Luiselli, are hinged between two literary traditions that look at each other with distance and mistrust. It is still possible to ask if Mexican literature can open itself to other traditions in the upcoming years, and if it can take a prominent position in world literature while keeping its heterogeneous character. We can even ask if Mexican literature will find a way to read its own tradition from the viewpoint of world literature and the global South. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roberto. Um, you have covered a great deal of ground uh, and I hopefully we'll come back to some of the issues that you've raised uh, and have you um, talk a little bit further about some of these, some, some of these subjects and themes. Um, I'd like to now ask Carl van Weyck to give us a sense of um, the state of play in South African contemporary literature. Carl, over to you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> in 1947, one year before apartheid, Arthur Keppel Jones, a Wits University historian at the time, published a novel of sorts styled as a, as a historical account of South Africa's history of sorts. The book's title in full is When Smuts Goes, A History of South Africa from 1952 to 2010, first published in 2015. The narrative, written as though in retrospect, may be read as a warning of Afrikaner nationalism. Keppel Jones, again writing in 1947 as though from 2015, speaks of how in 1952, Afrikaner nationalism took over South Africa. Divisions between black and white were amplified. Schools were forced to use Afrikaans as a medium of instruction. The ruling party was met with black militant force around the 1960s and 1970s. In the, in the 1980s, a messianic black leader commanded a following that eventually toppled the segregationist government. The new black government quickly fell into disgrace as corruption and described day-to-day -day business. A disease plagued the nation in the 1990s, the, effect of which were the effects of which were exacerbated by governmental nepotism and ineptitude. And finally, around the turn of the new millennium, South Africa, once filled with hope, came to its ap apocalyptic finality. Much of this did happen, of course, except the last part. South Africa did not endure an apocalyptic end. Indeed, there is no end at all. Time persists and stories continue to be told. At the same time of the publication of Keppel Jones' book, at the time of apartheid's inception, two other novels emerged as international readers became increasingly interested in South Africa's then present. These novels were Peter Abrams' Mind Boy and Alan Payton's Cry the Beloved Country. Mind Boy is about Gluma, or as some characters affectionately call him, Gluma from the North. His geographical origins are a mark of his difference. He moves to Johannesburg seeking work on the mines. Though he thinks nostalgically of his home, longing to return, he eventually finds a space in Johannesburg, finds a way to belong to the city. We know this because the nostalgia with which he thinks about his farm is the same nostalgia that informs his attitudes to Johannesburg towards the end of the novel. He thought of the night he had gone to the house that had been Leah's. He had left his room and walked slowly, and people had greeted him for he had become a citizen of Malay camp and people showed it in their eyes and he had known that they knew about Eliza, for in a strange manner that no one knows, the people of Fyrodorp and Malay camp get to know about everybody else. 
In Peyton's Cry the Beloved Country, Black bodies don't belong in the city. The author's passive exclusion of Blackness from this space informs the plot. Stephen Kamalo, the preacher or Mfundisi, lives in rural Ndocheni, a farming space rapidly becoming barren, a space from which various members of his family have fled, seeking opportunity in Johannesburg. Stephen must go to Johannesburg to reconstitute his disparate family. His sister is a prostitute and owns a shabin in the city. His son, while in Johannesburg by some wild coincidence, murders the son of the white farmer Stephen Kamalo calls a neighbor back in, in Ndocheni. After Stephen's son has, um, is hanged for his crime, the white farmer Jarvis, in an act of forgiveness, assists Stephen and his community to re redevelop their land. At a time in South Africa's history where the unrecognized crimes of white against black were at their most vile and would continue to be so for more than 50 years, Peyton determines that to transcend the racial figures of the country, white must forgive black. The ruptures that define South Africa's society may for Peyton be addressed by a singular and elegant solution, white people. Jarvis, the white farmer, sends a knowledgeable black man from the city to assist Stephen and, and his community to restore his land. The black man's name is Napoleon Letsitsi, but he is known as the demonstrator. He is also political and intent on black liberation. This seems to rub Stephen the wrong way. Stephen, like Socrates, poses uh, questions to the demonstrator rather than outright arguing with him, passively swaying his political beliefs. When the restoration of the land, um, sorry, when Stephen invites the demonstrator to say where he had learned about black liberation and the restoration of the land, the demonstrator responds, I was taught that in Fundisi. It was a white man who taught me. Stephen concedes, this man was wise. The demonstrator continues, it was he also who taught me that we do not work for men, that we work for the land and the people. We do not even work for money, he said. By the novel's end, we learn that first, the rightful place of black people is outside the city. And second, the origin of black self-definition and self-liberation comes from anywhere but blackness itself. It comes from whiteness. Through vastly different means, through different language, different political and philosophical motivations, Abrams and Peyton put into focus the racial and political divisions that would be the concern of much of South African writing in the decades that followed. Yet it would be myopic to suggest that Peyton, Abrams, and others of the time could be called upon as the only sources to which we could turn to determine our current state in politics of storytelling. They are, first, only some writers among many, and second, instantiations of a very specific moment that was the product of centuries of history. They are by no means the beginning or the only beginning. In the same way, it would be unwise to suggest that 1994, the year of South Africa's first democratic elections, marked the end of ruptures, separations, and traumas anticipated by authors such as Kibble Jones, Peyton, and Abrams. After 1994, readers, critics, academics, writers attempted to define and draw lines around the literature that would emerge thereafter, each trying to lay claim to the new literary era in which they found themselves, each trying to define what now comes after. Post-apartheid, post-transitional, post-TRC or post-Truth and Reconciliation Commission and post-millennial were all um, in circulation and still are. The adherence to the prefix is revealing. As Toni Morrison would say about postmodern, postcolonial, and post Cold War literatures, our contemporary prophecies look back behind themselves, post, after, what has gone on before. It is true, of course, that all knowledge requires a grasp on its precedence. Still, it is remarkable how often imaginative forays into the far and distant future have been solely and simply opportunities to reimagine or alter the present as past. And this looking back, though enabled by technology's future, offers no solace whatsoever for humanity's future. Surrounding the platform from which the backward glance is cast is a dire repulsive landscape. Written in March 1996, under the context of more global concerns, Morrison turns to the contemporary novelist Ben Ockrey, William Gass, Tony Cade Bambara, Leslie Mumm Silko as a response to pessimistic ideations of the future, studying the ends of their stories by way of refuting the absolute end. Of Almanac of the Dead, a novel by Silco, an author of composite identities, Native American, Anglo-American, and Mexican-American, 
Morrison considers the text's final image in which the snake was looking south in the direction from which the twin brothers and people would come. The future tense of the proverb, Morrison explains, is attached to a direction that is unlike directions of most comings we approve of, the south. There is a future, yet Morrison so shows that this, um, that this is the position of only some authors. In commenting on any literary era, one is forced always to speak only of some writers. That these some writers are of the contemporary moment makes the task that much trickier. Um, the contemporary moment is always a moving target. Equally suspicious of all things post, but focusing on South African history and its literature is academic Derek Hook. In post-apartheid conditions, taking its cue, of course, from Franz Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth and Sartre's introduction thereof, Derek Hook provides a psychoanalytic reading of the years after 1994, particularly of the years in and around the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The histories towards which Hook writes are the, are the years. Um, Derek Hook provides a psychoanalytic reading of the years after 1994, particularly of the years in and around the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The histories towards which Hook writes are the years shortly after apartheid's legislative end, a period marked by intentions to forgive and cohere. The author's nomenclature is deliberate and considered. He places parentheses around the post of post-apartheid. Apartheid, the author seems to suggest, has not ended. For Hook, present South Africans continue to work through their past, continue to seek avenues in which their mourning may be expressed and validated. Yet in ways more insidious and haunting, apartheid lingers. Its end tapering across the neat and hard boundaries suggested by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. How we've ended up, Hook believes, is in a state in which time assumes the form of a staccato tempo of abrupt truncations and precipitate beginnings. Some literature reflects this. In 2014, the same year in which Hook's text was published, Masanda Nchanga released his debut novel, The Reactive. In the story, characters slump through a drug-induced haze in and around Cape Town, selling drugs, doing drugs, prevented from moving meaningfully into the future because of past transgressions. They live in a space in which time seems to have lost form. Andrew van der Fliss describes it as a novel of stasis. Indeed, the protagonist's name, Linda Nati, translates from the Kosa as wait with us, apt as he becomes stuck between the traditions of his family and the life he has found with his new surrogate family in Cape Town. The reactive is set around 2002. Published in 2014, the stasis that describes the generation at the beginning of the new millennium seems reflected in the generation more than 10 years later. Stasis may also describe the year 1981, the year in which Nadine Gordon published her essay, Living in the Interregnum. Gordon uses the philosophical and political framework of Gramsci's definition of the interregnum, a term that describes a state in which the old have died and the new cannot be born. Writing within a South African context, this formulation takes on a racial dimension. As Gordimer writes that, the black knows he will be at home at last in the future. The white who has declared himself or herself for that future belongs to the white segment that was never at home in white supremacy, does not know whether he will find his home at last. Both black and white wait, consulting the opposite ends of the temporal spectrum in a pro protracted moment of suspense. The political landscape in 1981 was different to that of the reactives 2003 and different again to Nchanga and Hook's 2014. Politics and literature in South Africa then, at least in the past 40 years, seem to have been defined by periodic moments of stasis, similar to how Linda Nati in the reactive describes his temporal environment. Time seems to speed up here and then it stalls, and it seems to speed up again before it stalls. Yet waiting need not always be a sign of interrupted growth, as we learn by the novel's end, in which Linda Nati turns waiting into progress, biding his time to define himself anew. Visions of the past have always informed contemporary South African writing. Yet what has changed... Um, give me a second. Uh, visions of the past have always informed contemporary South African writing, yet what has changed is the form and color the past has assumed. This radical alteration is seen most evidently in Jacob Lamini's non-fictional texts, Native Nostalgia, published in 2009, and Ascari, published in 2014. In Native Nostalgia, Lamini considers what it would mean to look upon with fondness a Black childhood growing up in apartheid. 
in Ascari Dalmini writes of Mr. X1, the book's titular Ascari, a black footman who is informally assigned the task of intelligence gathering and capturing the torturing, capturing and torturing black political dissidents of the apartheid government. Both texts seem to suggest that apartheid, though still morally abhorrent, cannot be colored or narrated in the obvious ways, particularly in ways we've been doing after 1994. Under the weight of these texts, history seems to shift, necessitating the telling of new stories with new forms, metaphors, characters, and colors. Where Dlamini sets his sights on the margins of apartheid, Terry Kurgan sets apartheid at the margins of a 29 book, Everyone is Present, focusing instead on that other 20th century crime against humanity, a story of 1930s Europe told from South Africa. Like Dlamini's texts, Kurgan's is a work of narrative nonfiction. The author tracks her family's history through her grandfather's photographs taken as they flee Poland while Nazi Germany invades their country. After meandering across the world, they end up in Cape Town. In an attempt to overcome the temporal dis distance between herself and the past, Kurgan employs a few tricks. She narrates the past from the present tense. She immerses herself in her grandfather's photographs by assuming the postures of the subjects within, and she attempts to walk within the captured space. For Kurgan, new digital technologies prove inadequate for the kind of historical walking for which she advocates. Google's map, Kurgan argues, shaped of course by social algorithms, reflects the utter impossibility in 2015 of distinguishing the 900 year old Polish named town from what happened in the German camp on its edges in the middle of the 20th century. In the same way that, say, Ivan Vladislavic in Portrait with Keys walks through Johannesburg, thereby reading Johannesburg, Terry Kurgan adopts a manner of walking through her family's history to better read it. The success of Kurgan's writing is determined only by the success of her reading. And part of the success of her reading is also to recognize the shortcomings of her own interpretations, or as she puts it, the complete impossibility of very particular kind of retrieval. A sobering response, but one that does not negate the multiple possibilities and performances of reading that came before, particularly when reading one's history. Fred Kumalo is another contemporary voice, voice who endeavors to look back so as to look forward. This is evident in many of his works. My particular focus is on how he expresses this in short fiction. In the past five years, Fred Kumalo has released two anthologies of short stories. One of these is Talk of the Town and the other a coat of many colors. Talk of the Town begins with a nostalgic story with the title that inspired the name of the anthology. In the story, a woman is intent on furnishing her new home, but, her purchased, um, but has purchased her new furniture on credit. The story ends with the furniture about to be repossessed because her innocent children rat her out to the man who's come to find out about the, the mother's late payments. At last, the mother must face the humiliation endured by several in her community. The story unconventionally is told in the second person. The protagonist is present yet removed, as he does not speak, but is spoken to. He is the you of the narrative, which in the end is styled as a childhood memory about which the protagonist must be reminded by the narrator. Perhaps he has forgotten it. Perhaps the memory of this, of his and his siblings' betrayal of their mother is too much to carry with him into the present. Perhaps it is best left in the past. Yet Kamala's lightness and humor suggest otherwise. It sways what we would ordinarily read into a story set during the time depicted. This is not a partitator's grand narrative. The children's betrayal in the final sentences of the story serve as a reminder that innocence in a partitator was not lost. It was one part of a much larger picture we are still piecing together. In Soweto Under the Apricot Tree, Nick Mklongo offers rich and varied short stories about a South African township. The tree under which Soweto rests and shifts bears many fruits. The conceit around which Mklongo's collection revolves is an idea of Soweto as plural. Its stories take place in Soweto itself and in the white suburbs in which some of its previous black residents now reside and even up in the air as one of the stories takes place on a plane. To these stories collectively, there is no end, or rather its end tapers indefinitely, particularly as Soweto transcends its time and place and instead becomes a state of mind, evolving, repeating, adapting. In poetry, Lebohan Mashile has influenced a generation of young South African authors, exemplifying the mood and subject matter of poetry in South Africa today. 
And she really is also important because of the modes and media of representation across which she communicates. A sign of the split attentions contemporary readers must develop if we are to engage fully and meaningfully with today's writers. Mashile publishes books of poetry, is most famously a performance poet, and even performs creative essays. In Tomorrow's Daughters, from her famous anthology, In a Ribbon of Rhythm, Mashile's narrator speaks of writing a poem, one about pretty black girls who don't relax and lie their dreams away, voices that curl the straight edge of history. The poem's pretty black girls are subjects who are present only insofar as they respond to their past. The past against which the narrator speaks is straight. It is one from which there can be no deviation, from which there can be no kink or curl. The result, as academic Uhuru Palafala, um, Palafala puts it, is that Mashile and our mother's daughters of tomorrow are here, retrieving a wholesome past poked with holes and lies about forbidden fruits in the garden to make it whole again. The poem's final words are ones that advocate for more words, particularly written ones written by pretty black girls wearing crowns of change. These lines are a call for an embodiment of history, cruise history, nappy history, history that weaves and twists both back and forward. Perhaps the last 18 months have meant that in South Africa and the rest of the world, we have entered a new kind of stasis, one multiplied by the stasis that some critics assumed was there to begin with. Yet current South African literature seems to suggest otherwise. Some texts by some authors seem to figure South Africa as a space of anticipation. Some authors assume a plural future as a consequence of what they perceive as a plural history. Thank you. Very much, Carl. Um, Carl and Roberto, you, you've both um, given very a very comprehensive overview of, of these two uh, literary arenas and it's going to be quite difficult to extract from from everything that you've said um, some some salient points because this is a very they're both very rich presentations so um, but I'm going to to try to link what you've said um, by starting off uh, referring to what seems to emerge in both of your presentations. Roberto, you talk about revisionism. Um, you talk about a, uh, a particular stance vis-a-vis -vis both history and tradition in contemporary Mexican literature. Carl, you talk about a rapture, um, a revision, a swerve, I think is the word you used. Uh, you use the word post several times to, to, to articulate this swerve, this revision um, away of, of South African, contemporary South African literature away from history and to tradition. And both of you name very important dates in the respective histories of, of our two countries. Roberto, you refer to the formation of NAFTA, uh, the Zapatista uprising in 1994, um, and the Guerra contra Narco beginning in 2006. Um, and I suppose some um, similarly important dates, Carl, would be, you know, obviously the, the rise of the National Party in 1948, um, 1994, um, the, the TRC beginning in 1996, and possibly, though you don't mention it, but perhaps an event that's emblematic of state violence, um, the, the Mar uh, Maricona Massacre of 2012, in which um, uh, more than 30 minors were shot by, um, by the police. Um, so both of you are referring to this relationship to history. And I wondered if you could both talk a little bit about it. Carl, particularly since you uh, go on to say that, that South African contemporary literature is also concerned with Kind of stasis that's the word you you've just used um, and that it might be better to to describe it as 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 existing in a kind of interregnum and you gave Gram Gramsci's definition of this word um, so perhaps both and I'm going to lead on to a second question if you could both talk a little bit more about this complicated relationship both to history and, and to tradition and Roberto starting with you <clears throat> Yeah, thank you, Ronwin. Yeah, uh, I think one of the most interesting things in, in contemporary Mexican literature is that it's, it's not only 
the construction of a, of a new canon, mm -hmm. but the, the identification of some uh, blind spots in the Mexican tradition. I mean, we have a very important um, female writers, for example, a very well-known female writers. Uh, mm -hmm. a, a woman is in, in, in the base of our canon, uh, the poet from the colonial uh, period, uh, Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the women can uh, occupy uh, uh, most, uh, a more visible uh, trend in contemporary uh, or, or, or in Mexican uh, history of, of literature. And that revisionism, it's very important because allows to recent poets and writers and novelists to create a, not, a, not a new vision of Mexican literature, but a vision that was already there, but it wasn't clearly enough. So it's, 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 I, I think one of the most interesting things in, in, in this revision is the combination, the, the mixture of study of Mexican tradition and creation of a new Mexican trend. So this, this mixture is, is, is complicated, but I think it's, it's very interesting because allows to integrate some uh, forgotten genres, some forgotten authors, uh, and some forgotten languages even. And I think that's the, 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 the starting point of a different conceptualization of literature, more open, more critical, uh, critical with the past of Mexican racism, for example, uh, critical with the creation of the Mexican state, the national state, but without forgetting the very relevant tradition of Mexican social realism, of Mexican uh, critical literature with the state, etc. I don't know if, if that does make yeah, sense. Thank you. thank you, Roberta. Yes, that's it's um, that is a very interesting answer. Let's go to Carl, and then I'll come back to some of the things that you've raised. Carl, go ahead. Um, yeah, I'm I'm quite open to using the word revisionist history, and it's a word that it's a term that I use as well. I'm quite um, I'm quite open to what that could signify. But um, some historians are reluctant to use the term revisionist historian or revisionist history. Um, the argument being that all history really is revisionist history. All history, um, once written down is um, or, or pursued as a project, is tries to um, demonstrate to us living in this contemporary moment that um, what we had thought to be true in, historically isn't necessarily always so. Um, so even though um, I'm sort of happy to use the, the term revisionist history, I do agree with some authors that all history really is revisionist history. And this is a trend I identify, again, as I repeat throughout the paper, that is evident in some writers. Um, not all writers do this. I think some authors, um, one author that, um, whose, whose name can't, I don't recall right now, um, some authors are quite reluctant to play around with history um, seeing it as offensive, seeing it as far too radical, perhaps even seeing it as inaccurate, um, that history should be kept as this sort of hermetically sealed, precious thing that shouldn't be tampered with. Um, but those who are more revisionist in their approach, like Jacob Lamini, who I think is the best example, um, at least from what I detailed in the paper, um, is the very opposite of that. He looks at history and exactly what happened. And in determining the truth without actually negating um, the um, his stance on what apartheid sort of symbolized and it's, um, what it's um, how we can be described morally that it was something wrong that happened in our, in our history. He's not afraid either to show that on the margins of those stories, on those stories that we become far too complacent with and far too familiar with, 
um, that these other things also did happen. And that should be reckoned with. Um, it should be um, part of the kinds of stories that we tell, and it should be sort of weaved into the grand narratives that we um, that we keep on repeating to ourselves for the sake of um, perhaps a defense mechanism or, or the, whatever the case is. Um, but those are the kinds of authors that I'm, I'm particularly interested in um, reading generally and just for also for my research. Um, those kinds of authors that are um, that I intend to disrupt the kinds of comfort zones that we've established ourselves, particularly um, with the kinds of narratives um, that we've written down, the kind of historical narratives that we've written down. Thanks, Carl. Um, I wonder if I could um, perhaps narrow the scope of the discussion uh, to, to something that I think is important for both literatures, um, the literature of both of these of our countries. And that has to do with, a, with the relationship between the city and um, um, the city and the, and the rural landscape. Um, in South Africa, obviously, this relationship is um, deeply inflected by apartheid history, by the movement of people from rural to urban centers because of forced migration, because of migratory labor policies. Um, in, uh, in Mexico, I think it's, uh, it's a very different kind of um, relationship, Roberto. Um, and I wonder if you could both talk a little bit about novels that use the city as a kind of emblem of larger questions, larger political and historical questions. Of course, in South Africa, it's very easy to, to seize upon Johannesburg as, the, as, as that kind of city. And in, in Mexico, it would obviously be Mexico City. And that's at the risk of being, um, of kind of talking about, of privileging those two cities. But I think there are important novels um, set in both of those cities that draw attention to some of the things that you've been talking about by, and situate some of these questions within a particular space, uh, a linguistic space, but also a geographic um, architectural space. So Carl, you know, you've mentioned Ivan Vladislavich, but there, there are numerous examples of, of, the, of the city novel, the novel that, um, that, that explicates our history through, um, through a, through a representation of the city. Um, so perhaps you could both talk a little bit about one or two writers who for you do this in a very interesting and particular way. Um, Roberto, you've already mentioned Cristina Rivera Garza, um, but I mean, there are many others. I'm thinking particularly now of Juan, uh, Juan Villalobos, who's, um, get the title right, Down the Rabbit Hole, Fiesta en la Mad Madriguera, I think is the Spanish title. Um, but there, there are numerous others. I wonder if you could talk to, to some of these writers. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, the, the main problem, the city, is because of the very centralized politics in Mexico, uh, it's it's very a numerous kind of novels take the Mexico City as a great allegory of the nation, even when the uh, the most important works from the 20th century was placed in the rural areas in the in. in, in, in Yes, in, 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 in all the rural parts of, of Mexico, in the desert, in the, uh, 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 in the jungle, etc. Et, et, et uh, but I think one of the main trendings in contemporary Mexican literature, it's a clearly division, not so clearly, but uh, as, I, as, I, as far as I can see, some kind of division between the narratives or the novels, the works that are set up in the city, in the middle class uh, characters, for example, and other works that are set up in not necessarily rural area areas, but 
cities that are not Mexico City. Mm -hmm. Cities in the north, cities in the south, with a lot of uh, migrants, uh, violence, cartels, uh, and other histories, uh, of course. And for example, the work of Juan Pablo Villalobos it's, mm -hmm. uh, is very interesting because he's a very cosmopolitan writer. He writes from, uh, from Barcelona, but he, his stories are uh, developed in, uh, in, in the interior of the, of the country, in Guadalajara, uh, but also uh, in Barcelona, also in Mexico City. I mean, this kind of author has a very great scope, a greater scope, of the, of, of the population, of the towns, of the cities. Uh, another, another example I can think uh, is, for example, the first book of Valeria Luiselli, mm -hmm. which is a, a collection of essays about the city, but from a cosmopolitan view also. It is the Mexico City, but it's also uh, Venetia, but it's also uh, uh, looking for the thumb of, I, I don't remember what writer is uh, in Berlin, I think, I, I, I don't remember exactly. But I mean, I mean uh, we can make this division between rural and city, but also we can think in a more um, motley relation between yeah. urban areas and rural areas. Not, yeah, it's not the Mexico City as the inevitable center of the country. Right. Carl, maybe a novel like Miss Sundin Changa's Triangulum, you mentioned the reactive, this is a novel set in Cape Town, but perhaps something like a novel like Triangulum, which, which, which uh, makes the kind of movement that Roberto is describing from a, from a, a city environment to a rural Eastern Cape environment um, might be, um, the kind of novel that, that emblematizes something of what Roberto is describing. Would you, would you argue in the same direction um, in, in regard yeah, to South um, I read Triangulum in 2019 when it was released and though I liked it, cannot remember it. So it's not really a text that I can draw on for um, this discussion like that, but that the author certainly is. Um, Sandy Nshange is one who is particularly interested in um, city spaces and rural spaces and um, sort of discussing and perhaps even problematizing how we um, in South Africa set them up as dualities to each other, as, as we sort of do globally, I suppose. Um, but adding to the, the long list of dualities that South Africans define themselves by, um, he adds to that the city and the rural space. Um, I think it takes place in the Trans Sky, or his, his works often take place in the Trans Sky, and that is sort of the the rural heartland of his characters, and that is where they uproot themselves from. There's another text by Masanda Nchanga, um, Space, which is a short story he wrote. Um, can you still hear me? Yes. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, he wrote that story in about 2012 or so, or just before. Um, it was nominated for the Kane Prize and the, the short story itself the, and the title um, sort of gives it away what it's about. It's about the space that he occupies, but it's also about, um, and he's, he draws upon sort of science fiction elements in the same way that he does for Triangulum, um, where Triangulum is more firmly set in as, as a sort of Afrofuturist text. Um, space plays around with um, ideas of science fiction and um, the boys in the story sort of use the language of science fiction to define themselves within the space they inhabit. Um, in something like the reactive, um, there is that move from the rural to the city, the rural area to the city, where we first find the character um, Linda Nati within the city of Cape Town, and he gets a message from his uncle, I think, calling him back to um, to his roots, to his rural, the rural area from which he came. Um, and the, the novel, sort of the tension of the novel is, um, will he return? What I find quite progressive about the spatial politics within the city, um, and the dynamic between the rural and the city is that um, the character through his own self-determination um, 
chooses to go back to the rural space from which he came, as opposed to something like Peyton's text, Try the Beloved Country, um, where the author very much forces Black people to, to the rural spaces and pushes them out of the city. So that move there is one that is politicized in um, sort of the, the opposite way of what Chisanga is trying to advocate for. Um, yeah, but one example. Yeah. Thanks, Carl. Uh, I'm just watching the time. It's 6.20. There are a few questions. Um, some, some I think have been addressed and apologies to everyone in advance. I can't, we won't get to all of the questions. Um, but perhaps one, one might be interesting for us to talk about, um, which has to do, uh, Roberto, you talked about the professionalization of, of writing. And you made particular reference to creative writing programs in the US um, where some Mexican writers are teaching or have gone to study, um, which obviously has impacted um, not only their own writing, but the way in which uh, their writing is viewed in Mexico. So this is perhaps a double, a double question. Um, First of all, what is the, this is just looking at the chat, what is the, how, how would you describe the relationship between literary criticism and creative writing? I'm not sure that um, one can polarize those two, but perhaps talk a little bit about creative writing as something that's um, had an enormous impact on the way in which writing is in, in Mexico has been professionalized. Um, Carl, I don't know if you can speak to the same question. Um, Roberto, starting with yeah, you. Um, I, I, yeah, uh, I, I think one, one of the most interesting things happening now in Mexican literature mm -hmm. is the relation with the professionalization programs. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of writers, as I say, as, as, as you uh, said it uh, also, a lot of writers, of Mexican, Latin American writers, uh, teach or study or have studied in their uh, creative programs in USA, mostly. Uh, a very few has also has studied in uh, Spain, for example. But in Mexico, we don't have a consolidated uh, group of programs of creative writing. We have a lot of workshops, for example, uh, workshops on literature, or on some genres, novel, poetry, etc. But those workshops are part of the uh, institutionalization of literature into fellowships, into grants uh, from the Mexican government. So it's, it's not a uh, it, it's it's a way to get prestige but it's not a way to get a job, for example. But the, the interesting thing is a lot of writers who go to, to MFA programs and return to Mexico have a lot of uh, knowledge of the market, of the publishing houses, of the trending in forms, in themes, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the critic, that the critics and the criticism can see this as a major trend. We can see some themes, we can see some uh, groups of writers, but see it as a major trend that is forming or, or, or transforming the Latin American institutions, the Latin American tradition, I think that's a lack of our criticism. Uh, a lot of very important critics in the US are writing about this. But ironically, the critics in, Mexi in Mexico are not necessarily writing about this. So we have a, a, a kind of disconnection, but also a very profound connection, a, 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 an, an entangled relation in writing, but a separation in criticism. And that's, I, I think that's gonna be one of the main problems in the near future in Mexican contemporary literature. Yeah, thanks Roberto. Maybe um, it might be more useful, Carl, for you to talk a little bit about um, 
criticism, actually. I think that's a very um, rich vein of, 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 of uh, discussion for us. Um, are you able to comment on the way you see criticism, not literary criticism as it's, uh, as it's represented in, in um, tertiary institutions, but literary criticism um, outside of the, ac the academy? Are you, do you see that as uh, somehow failing writers in South Africa? What do you see as its role in the representation um, of, of South African literature? Um. That's something I haven't really given much thought to. I must apologize. It's um, sort of the, the paradigm of literary production in South Africa that I, I don't really give much thought to, um, only because I'm primarily interested in what is produced finally. Um, I don't often, my research doesn't sort of um, gear me to looking at the politics around publication or literary, literary criticism um, and how it um, hinders or supports writers and their endeavors. But in that conversation, I think, Brahman, you are the person to answer that question more appropriately than I am. Um, being there to create a writing out of it, I would, I would appreciate your response to that question, if you don't mind. Yeah, well, I think um, a couple of thoughts. One is that uh, this might be also true in Mexico, Roberto. You can, you can confirm or, 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 other, or, or otherwise, um, is that there's a newspapers were the primary repositories of, of literary criticism outside of the academy in South Africa. And what's happened in the last 10 to 15 years is a, is a real um, slaughtering, actually, I think that's maybe the best word to use, of any kind of literary criticism in South African, in the South African media. Um, the arts in general have been relegated to back pages of newspapers uh, and are given very little space. And I think that as a result, um, the, the sort of public discourse that would have flowed out of vibrant literary criticism of that kind is, takes different forms. I don't think it's not, it's, it's completely absent, but it's um, it, it takes a very different form now as a result of the way in which news media treats literature and arts in general. Um, Roberto, is that, is that, I presume that's something you're seeing. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a larger yeah, problem yeah. for the media, but yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a great, it's a, I, I think it's one of the most important problems for literary criticism Right now, we have a lot of universities uh, doing research, doing criticism, but but that doesn't doesn't that doesn't mean that that critique that that uh, uh, readings of, of, of literature uh, are also read by the public. Mm. We read each other. Right. Uh, most uh, a lot of writers read what we can say about them, right. and we read writers, but the major public is, is mostly absent. And yeah, that, that's a problem of the media. That's a problem of the, of the condensed media in very few hands. And that's a global problem, of course. Right. And Bronwyn, just to add on to what your, on, onto your comment, um, you sort of positioned it that the critic is the mediator between um, the, the writer and the audience. And it's yeah, certainly true. And um, that it has been relegated to the back pages of the newspaper has, is unfortunate. And what is also apparent now within this moment is that we've lost on um, literary culture in real space, taking place in real space, that we don't, we aren't afforded the opportunity to go to a book launch where we can face the author, the audience can face the author and engage with the author more meaningfully rather than be, being mediated through a critic of a newspaper. So I think um, the pandemic has been locked inside our homes has certainly exacerbated that problem. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would agree. <laughs> uh, it's made certain things possible and made other things disappear entirely. Um, yeah, this, I, this is lovely, but I would prefer being in a real room with all of you. Yeah, exactly. Um, I've been told that we can have about 10 minutes more because we started late, so we can keep going for a little bit if you're happy to do so. 
uh, and I want to take a slight, um, I want to take a little bit of a, a detour, not a detour, but a, a turn away from the, the discussion now. I want to talk a little bit about the role of, of poetry in South African and Mexican literature. Both of you uh, touched on uh, one or two poets, um, and I want to talk about this a little bit more, but I want to link it to the question of language. Um, I suppose in poetry, uh, more so than in, in, in fiction, we're able to see some of the um, some of the sort of micro issues that relate to how we absorb and, and deal with language as writers and as readers of literature. Um, it's, I, I was just sort of looking for a moment, and maybe this is instructive for everyone apart from me, um, just to look at uh, the sort of structures of languages in our, in our two countries. South Africa is a, is a country of about 60 million people. Mexico is a country of about 130 million people. Um, in South Africa, the most widely spoken language is Isizulu, it's spoken by about 12 million people, followed by Sikosa, uh, then Afrikaans, which has 7 million speakers, 76% uh, of whom are black speakers, or what we call in South Africa, colored speakers of Afrikaans. Um, uh, English is the fourth most widely spoken, although if you look at it in different ways, I think uh, Sepedi and Setswana are very closely, um, they're very hot on the, 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 the trail of English. Um, and it depends also whether you're looking at uh, English sp uh, languages spoken within homes or outside of homes. Um, in Mexico, it's a very different linguistic landscape in, uh, where 90% of Mexicans speak Spanish in, in, um, in the country with, um, I think the closest other language is Nahuatl, excuse, excuse the way I pronounce this, but with, with 1.6 million speakers. Um, so in South Africa, um, one of the, one of the, issues that we grapple with as writers and as readers of literature is the relationship between the dominant language of publishing, which is English in South Africa, and the other languages. There are 11, uh, there are 11 official languages in South Africa, but in fact, far more actual languages, at least 35 languages, and there are many more in Mexico. So I wonder if you could both speak a little bit, first of all, about languages in general, about translation, um, and then perhaps about the way in which poetry addresses this, because it seems to me that there, um, there are more in South Africa, there are more poets writing in um, so South African languages other than English. And I wonder if the same is true in Mexico, Roberto. So perhaps, Carl, if you would try to address this difficult, <laughs> complicated question, if you can. Yeah, I, I guess. Um... The, the reason for, uh, as you say correctly, that um, poetry sort of lends itself to, well, there have been lots of black languages um, that have been more receptive to poetry. And I think the medium of the art form suggests why that would be, that it is more experimental, more playful. Um, it does, um, it, it is more challenging and more, um, you know, and more experimental than what would, um, in comparison to prose writing, the novel um, is the best example of that. So I think the medium of it sort of lends itself to that and sort of obvious why that would may, may be so. I think also um, that there is a tradition of poetry within South Africa in which um, authors, black authors would write in black languages or write in English and disrupt English with black languages. Um, there were several poets within um, the, the six, 70s and 80s who were doing this all the time. So I think that trajectory is certainly um, that there is a trajectory from from then to now that it sort of explains that, um, but, yeah. Hmm. Roberto, yeah, I I would say that many, if not all, the Mexican poets that write in an indigenous language also write in Spanish. Hmm. Uh, it's very difficult to find and, and, and very, very difficult to publish a poet in an indigenous language that is not translated into Spanish. Because the main, the, the main of the readers, most of the readers are in Spanish 
language. Of course, there are a lot of readers in uh, the original the, or, or the indigenous languages, but they, they lack of a, of a literary field specialized in, in, in their own language. They lack of an infrastructure for uh, reading uh, uh, and publishing and, and, and also criticize their own, uh, uh, their own uh, uh, literature. So uh, from, from some years to now, it's been a lot of uh, infrastructure uh, programs that, are, that, that try to integrate the indigenous population into the mainstream of the culture. But that doesn't mean that that integration implies an autonomy, uh, a respectful way to uh, publish in, in, in their own language. So we have a, a, a bilingual field, subfield in contemporary Mex in Mexican literature with a lot of poets, a very interesting poets, a, a very powerful poets, but for example, to publish a work in Nahuatl or in Ñañú or in Cetzil or in another Mexican indigenous language, it's a very, ra very radical and very powerful politically uh, uh, stance, but it doesn't mean that, that we'll have readers. Most of the people of Mexico that are bilingual are in Spanish are and English, for example, Spanish and other languages. In, in, in schools, we don't teach indigenous languages to other people that are not the, uh, the speakers of that language. So it, it's, it's a rupture. It's a, it's, it's, it's a, uh, we have two infrastructures, one main infrastructure of integration and one infrastructure for their own languages. But that doesn't mean these languages are going to get into the main population that speaks Spanish. And yet that, that, that is a, a main problem. Right, right. Uh, Roberto, thank you very much. Um, I've been alerted to the fact that I should um, make some closing remarks. Uh, it's it's difficult to do this because I think there's as much that we haven't said um, as what we have said. This has been extremely an extremely rich discussion and it's introduced us to some very important uh, themes and ideas that hopefully will be continued as we uh, as we continue the series. So I want to thank both of you very much. I want to thank both of you very much for preparing for this seminar in the way that you have, for being so thoughtful and giving it the attention that you have. Um, and uh, thank you to all of you who've participated, who've signed up in Mexico and in South Africa and elsewhere in the world. I hope that you've enjoyed this session. Please keep a lookout for the conversations between South African and Mexican writers that will begin early next year. We will send out notification I believe our first two speakers will be Terry Kurgan and Valeria Luiselli, uh, but we'll confirm closer to the time. You both mentioned these two writers, so I think we'll look, very much look forward to meeting them in person and talking to them. Thank you, everybody. It's been a wonderful discussion. Uh, see you in 2022. Uh, come back and join us then. Good night, and thank you again. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure, Carl. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks, Bronwyn. Good night. Thank you. Thanks, Bronwyn. Good night. Thanks. Good night, everyone.